guy the other day who's saying that um, uh, his pastor had gone on vacation and then he had a couple things come up and he had to go out of town and he had asked the uh, deacons to fill in for him. And when he came back, he asked somebody, he said, how'd everything go? They said, well, so you're safe when you're traveling. He said, as long as you get them deacons filling in for you, so people are going to be safe, praying for your safe return. <laughs> so uh, I, I can tell Pastor Bobby, I said, hey, y'all pray for it, no matter what you do. <laughs> um, we're going to be in the book of Amos tonight. We're going to actually be looking, we're going to read a lot of scripture, but it's all to prove point. We only have um, a few that we're going to be really diving into. Um, but the uh, question for tonight is uh, what's your standard or what's the standard that we live by? Um, we all know that we're Christians and we fall into a very uh, dangerous trap sometimes because what's um, the one thing that Christians can feel good about themselves? It's we, when we compare ourselves to the world. Um, we're almost like siblings. If you uh, have siblings or had more than one child, do you ever get on to that child and all of a sudden that you hear them go, well, at least I didn't do so-and-so, or at least I'm not like so-and-so, or at least, you know, so-and-so didn't do this or didn't do that. But we're, whenever we can find someone to compare ourselves to, we can always put ourselves up on a pretty high shelf. And so I asked the question tonight, um, what's the standard we try to live to? We know that this world is lost. We know that this world is wicked. We know that um, the Bible tells us just percentage-wise, there's probably going to be more people that die and go to hell than there are that are going to live in eternity with Christ. Uh, it says, uh, you know, narrow is the gate. And... Um, I think a lot of times we look at the world around us and if we're not careful that can cause us to feel good about ourselves because it doesn't matter what we have going on in our lives at least we're not drunks at least we're not living in an immoral relationship at least we're not dabbling in homosexuality at least we're not uh, dabbling in pornography all these different things no matter what we have going on but is that the standard God wants us to live to? Um, is that the standard that God wants us to show to this world? That it doesn't matter what the world is, we're just a little bit better than they are. Well, one of the big problems is something that we touched on in one of the messages that I uh, preached last week is that who are we to serve? Um, are we only to serve our brothers and sisters in Christ? No, not at all. We're to serve others. And in doing that is when others see the love of Christ in us. Um, we're basically just patting ourselves on the back if the only people that we're ever looking to help and willing to help are the ones that sit beside of us in church or other churches or things like that. Um, and we're going to be looking at these two um chapters of Amos and Amos just to give a very little bit of background Amos was originally uh, we kind of get two different things we, he basically was a, a, a field worker um, he calls himself in uh, chapter one he says uh, he was a herdsman of Tekoa but then later on in the book uh, in later chapters he refers himself as basically a reaper of fruit and when I was trying to study him out and find out a little bit more about him, um, he basically, it sounds like he was like a hired worker. He's like the type of person that all of his wages pretty much went to keeping himself alive. Now you think about that. You know, we, we think of all these um, prophets and these uh, men that God calls to do something, uh, to go and thus saith the Lord. Like we think of, you know, uh, Peter, James, and John being fishermen having pretty much their own business. Um, this wasn't the type of man that Amos was. God called him to go forth and say, thus saith the Lord, and he left his job. And so from what I'm understanding, he wasn't the type of man that would have a whole lot to rely on. So he goes from relying on his job simply to eat to relying on God 
to provide everything for them. And another thing that was pointed out when I was studying it, and I never really thought of this, have you noticed how many men in the Old Testament that were called of God to be prophets and these different um, special missions that he would put them on, how many of them were herdsmen or shepherds or farmers or something like that? And he goes to ask the question, you know, we know of Jesus being the, you know, the, our shepherd, um, pastor being an under-shepherd. He is led as Christ leads, and then we follow him as he follows Christ. But one of the things that was pointed out is these jobs, whether it be a shepherd or whether it be a herdsman, whether it be a farmer, these things are requiring patience. You are, whether you're working with livestock or you're working with uh, farming or anything like that, you're taking something that basically doesn't exist until you put the time and effort and patience into it. Um, you know, Brother Richie deals in cattle. He can buy two cows and before long, well, I'll say before long, but if he does everything the way he should, he can have an entire herd in just a few years. But what does it take? It takes patience and it takes time. Um, when you go and buy a pack of seeds and decide to plant them, that $2 packet of seeds that you bought, now all of a sudden might be able to feed an entire neighborhood. But what does it take? It takes patience and time. And we as Christians, we are put into this world to produce what? To produce fruit. We're to produce things for Christ. And what is it going to take? It's going to take patience. It's going to take time. Um, we can't live as a Christian, tell others about Christ, and then stand and, you know, do this on Monday, and then Tuesday morning go stand out on the porch and look and say, well, it feels like they're just as bare as they were yesterday. I quit. I give up. I'm not, I'm not seeing anything. I'm not seeing what I'll wanted to see. I worked all day yesterday and I don't have anything to pick out of that field. Brother Richie, I bought a bailed uh, uh, heifer and a bull. I put them out in the field. I come out the next morning and still just two cows out there. Might as well grind them up for hamburger. It takes some patience and some time. And that's what Amos had to have here. Because he's about to go and he's about to give Israel a standard. And the first thing we're going to see as we start in verse 2, talking to Amos, he says, And he said, The Lord will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the habitation of the shepherd shall mourn, and the top of Carmel shall wither. Thus saith the Lord, For three transgressions of Damascus, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof. Let's pray. Father, we do pray that tonight we would look and we would ask ourselves, What's the standard that we're living by? Are we looking at the world beside of us and saying, well, we're better than them, but we're saved, and so therefore we're good? Or are we looking at Christ, who we see so incredibly pictured in every word um, that's written in your word? And Father, we have your Holy Spirit to lead, guide, and direct us. And we have access to prayer to ask you questions and to get the answers that we need through your word. And Father, you've given us pastors and teachers, and you've given us brothers and sisters in Christ that we have absolutely no excuse. You say in your word that we're thoroughly furnished for all good works. We have no excuse to compare ourselves to anything other than the standard, which is Christ. But Father, help us to look in our own lives and see um, what are the decisions we're making, what's the, what are the judgments we're making, and Father, help us to reconcile them and bring them in line with what you would have them to be. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So first of all, here in uh, the first or the latter part of chapter two, or verse two of chapter one of Amos, it says, "The Lord will roar from Zion and utter His voice from Jerusalem, and the habitations of the shepherds shall mourn, and the top of Carmel shall wither." So basically, what he's saying is, God is going to speak. God is going to speak. Uh, what was in Jerusalem, the temple? What was inside the temple? It was the dwelling place of the Ark of the Covenant. It was the the mercy seat of Christ. Or, excuse me, of God. Um, and it was a picture, um, you know, we talked that we've talked about before how the, um, priest would have to go in and it was behind the curtain and he would have to sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. Um, and it was a picture of Christ 
the blood atoning for our sins. Whereas this had to be done annually. Christ was at one point going to do it for all eternity if we just accepted it. I'll never forget, um, it's been, goodness, I can't remember if it was here or if we were at the school or if we were at Antioch, where, but I remember Brother Jim Pridgen taught a Sunday school lesson one time. It's something that's just never got out of my head is, you know, if you've ever seen pictures of the, uh, the top of the ark, the mercy seat, you know, it was two cherubim and they had their wings spread out and you were to go in and they were to place the blood between them on the mercy seat. And Brother Jim pointed out that when they, when the stone was rolled away and they went in and looked at the tomb, that where Jesus lay and where his body had was gone from, you had the cloth that was there stained with his blood and what was on each end, at the head end and the foot end of that table, was an angel. God in his, I don't even want to say a preview, you know, but showing what he was going to do later on. Um, it's incredible. For anybody that doubts the word of God and thinks a man can put that together is just beyond me. But I love Jesus, so I'm a little prejudiced about when it comes to his word. But here God, uh, Amos was saying that God is basically going to pronounce judgment. He said he's going to utter his voice from Israel, and the habitation of the shepherds shall mourn, and the top of Carmel shall wither. He's, he's saying here that when God speaks the way of life, should change. <clears throat> when God speaks, the things that we think are absolutely firm should change. Some of our beliefs should change if they're based on man. Some of our daily activities should change if they're based on what we want to do. But God goes on here, and he, uh, or Amos goes on as he speaks for God, and I want us to look at this one thing in verse 3. So thus saith the Lord, for three trans transgressions of Damascus and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof. We're going to see this term repeated over and over and over again. For three transgressions of whoever and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof. This is one of the, one of the reasons you really need to get into the Bible and study it. Because you may say, okay, what were the three transgressions? And especially, what's the fourth one? And as I was studying this, I found out this is basically an old Hebrew or Jewish idiom. It's the idea of say, idiom, not idiot. I know a lot of people may have misheard me there. Jewish idiom, a way of speaking. And what it meant is um, any time the Jewish people would put a number to something and then add one to it, it's the idea of it's too many to number. It's too many to number. If I said, you know, somebody said, well, what do you want to eat tonight? And I said, I don't know. There's five places plus one in Silo City. That would give you the idea of, well, there's just too many to name. You tell me where you want to go. Now, we know at 9 o'clock or 8 o'clock, I'm going to scare you. I ain't going to say 9 o'clock before I get out of here. But on a Wednesday night, there aren't that many places. So, um, but that's the idea. And, you know, I was thinking about that when we go through when the Bible talks about, you know, there are so many things that God hates. And then it adds one to it. You know, we, a lot of times we want to be specific. Well, it lists these five or six sins. And then it says, but the seventh one is lying. You know, we think, but it's putting more emphasis on that. That's the way I've always looked at it. But just something like that you can learn about the Jewish language can really help you understand what they were trying to say. That, you know, it's not that, all, just like the Ten Commandments. You know, um, there are more sins than just the ones that are listed in the Ten Commandments. And it's great to try to live by those, but there are so many other things that Christ wants to do in our life. But we're going to see this repeating here. He says, Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Damascus, and for four I will not turn away the punishment thereof. And then he lists um, what he's angry about. Because they have threshed Gilead with threshing instruments of iron. But I will send a fire into the house of Hazel, which shall devour the palaces of Benadad. Um, Hazel is just a way of pronouncing the king of Syria at the time, and uh, Benadad was his son. So he says, I'm going to send a fire into the house and devour the palace of the sun. I will break also the bar of Damascus, which is the capital of Syria, and cut off the inhabitant from the plain of Aben. And 
him that holdeth the scepter from the house of Eden, and the people of Syria shall go into captivity under Kerr, saith the Lord. This is the pattern we're going to see repeated. These are nations that are surrounding God's people. These are nations that are surrounding Israel and Judah. And God is going through one by one and saying, for all these sins, I'm going to punish them. Some of them he gets very specific. Some of them he just kind of tells them punishment's coming. Um, so we won't go into a lot. I just want you to know where they are. In verse 6, he says, Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Gaza, and for four I will not turn away the punishment thereof. Because they carried away captive the whole captivity to deliver them to eat, uh, deliver them up to Edom. But I will send a fire on the wall of Gaza, which shall devour the palaces thereof, and I will cut off the inhabitant from Ashdod, and him that holdeth the scepter from Ashkelon. And I will turn my hand against Ekron, and the remnant of the Philistines shall perish, saith the Lord God. Gaza was the main city in um, the Philistines, uh, or Palestine. She, get my words right. It was a capital city for the Philistines. Put it like that. And so, but this is an area that was surrounded. We know this all the time that we see um, the Philistines just basically doing little incursions. You know, we saw that in Sunday school uh, last week where Saul had left just because he almost has David pinned down and God saw fit to allow the Philistines to come in to Israel, so he had to run and chase them off. So now we have Syria and we have um, Gaza. Verse Nine, thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Tyrus, which is another city there, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they delivered up the whole captivity to Edom, and remembered not the brotherly covenant, but I will send a fire on the wall of Tyrus, which shall devour the spirit palaces thereof. Verse 11, thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Edom, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof. This is interesting here because Edom is a land that is bordering on the outside of Israel. But this is a descendant of God's people. Edom are people that were um, descended from, anybody know, participation? Esau. Esau, Jacob's brother. These are the people that were descended from him. And even though they would have been in the bloodline, they chose to follow along the line of Esau and the ways of Esau. And so, therefore, God is pronouncing this punishment on them. Um, and he says, Because he did pursue his brother with the sword, and he cast off all pity, and his anger did tear perpetually, and he kept his wrath forever. But I will send a fire upon Teman, which shall devour the palaces of Bozrah. Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of the children of Ammon, and for four I will not turn away the punishment thereof. Ammon is uh, one of the descendants of Lot. You remember when Lot came out of uh, Sodom, when God uh, saved him and his two daughters, they went into a cave, and they were so ignorant of God and his love, and his mercy, that these girls basically thought that the world was ending, there was no one left other than them two and Lot. So what they do? They got their father drunk, and had a child with him. Ammon was one of those children. And you know, it, it's amazing to me as I go through and look at, first of all, with Edom, I look here with, um, with Ammon, how many of the enemies of Israel came about simply from someone that was in God's family, not trusting them? If we go all the way back and look at, um, instead of waiting on Isaac, we had um, Hagar and, uh, and uh, Ishmael was born something that we're still dealing with today. But if you go into prophecy and look, you'll see that even God allowing that was just following right along in his plan. 
you know, just a little side question to ask yourself. How many things that are perpetual thorns in your side, perpetual things that we are dealing with on a daily basis are simply a result of us being children of God and not trusting him and making our own decision or making a snap decision or simply just not being willing to wait on him? How many things that Israel had that were a result of that? How many things do we have in our life? But he says here, he will not throw away the punishment thereof, because they have ripped up the women with child of Gilead, that they might enlarge their border. But I will kindle a fire in the walls of Rabbah, and it shall devour the palaces thereof, with shouting in the day of battle, with a tempest in the day of the whirlwind, and their king shall go into captivity. He and his princes together, saith the Lord. Chapter 2, verse 1. Thus saith the Lord, For three transgressions of Moab, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof. Moab was the other son that was born to the other daughter of Lot. And just a little lesson in Hebrew, that word Ammon actually means incest. That's what that word actually means. So this is something that these children, you know, uh, how many of you don't like a name you were given? Or what if your name and the, your children after you were going to be known from the sin that was committed that brought you into the world. You know, I'm not a big fan of being named Daryl, simply because no one in the brother ever knows how to spell it. Um, but I'll take that over anything else, you know, that I will be known forever because of something that my dad did. Um and so here in chapter 2, verse 1, um, Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Moab, and for four I will surely turn, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because he burned the bones of the king of Edom in the lime. But I will send a fire upon Moab, and it shall devour the palaces of Cariath, and Moab shall die with tumult, and shouting, and with the sound of the trumpet. And I will cut off the judge from the midst thereof, and I will slay all the princes thereof with him, saith the Lord. So here we're seeing something that I think in today's time, if we had a modern day prophet, if we didn't have the complete canon of the word of God, I believe that the prophet were to come and to declare all the punishments that God was going to deliver on to the enemies of God, how many of you think we'd be rejoicing? I think we absolutely would. We know what's going on over in Europe right now. If a prophet came up and said, for three sins of Russia and for four, God is going to do X. If so-and-so for North Korea, if so-and-so for um, Iraq, for Iran, Praise God. Well, what if it was the enemies of the Christian that we talk about here? They, for all the drunks, for all the homosexuals, for all the pornographers, for all the child molesters, for all those that perform abortions, God says he's going to do this. We'd be praising God. I, we know we would. Man, God is finally moving. God is finally moving. What we fail to see is in today's time, God's moving his love for others and bringing them to a knowledge of Christ. That's what God's moving is today. And I think in our own lives, we don't see that a lot. Because we like this Old Testament God. We like the God that we go to and say, God, deliver me from this and he steps in and he does something. We like the God, my back is against the wall and my enemies are closing in on me and God comes in and wipes them all out. When there's an enemy camp right outside your door and you don't have enough soldiers to fight it and God confuses them to the point that in the middle of the night they just kill each other because they think they're being attacked. We want to be like looking up on the hill and feel like we're alone and look up at the at the uh, the skyline and see rows and rows of angels with flaming swords ready to come and fight our battle for us. That's what we want to see. 
what we don't want to see is God telling us to love those that hate us. So Israel, looking at all these sins of the nations around them and hearing what God's going to do, was a blessing. And God listed some of the things that they did, and all of them were things that they had done to God's people. So they would be deserving of punishment to the eyes of the Jewish people and to the eyes of God. But then we get to verse 4 of chapter 2. Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Judah and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they have despised the law of the Lord and have not kept his commandments, and their lies caused them to err, after the which their fathers have walked. But I will send a fire upon Judah, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem. What was the sin that God now chooses to punish? He chooses to punish his own people because they lied to themselves about what God expected. They perverted the law, and they decided they wanted to follow in the traditions of their fathers instead of following, thus saith the Lord. We forget that a righteous and holy God not only demands a world to be righteous and holy, but even more so he demands his people to be righteous and holy. And we've got a divided kingdom here with Israel and Judah. So sure enough, they don't get off, about, off uh, free either. In verse 6, thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof. Because they sold the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of shoes that pant after the dust of the earth on the head of the poor and turn aside the way of the meek. And a man and his father will go in unto the same maid to profane my holy name. And they lay themselves down upon clothes laid to pledge by every altar. And they drink the wine of the condemned in the house of their God. So God covers his people here. And he says they are not going to go uh, unpunished. But whereas all the other nations that surrounded Israel were going to be punished for the things they had done to Israel, what is God punishing his people for? For the things they did against God. For the things that they did to each other. You know, he says there, um, we've, we've talked about it before, you go all through the Bible and God tells his people and tells us to look after, we always talk, there's three, three groups of people. Who are they? The orphans, poor, and the widows. The three groups of people that more than likely can do absolutely nothing in return for your help. And we fail to see, we fail to see how we are to the Lord Jesus Christ, widows, poor, the orphan. Because before we were saved, we had no heavenly father. We had no heavenly father. Before we were saved, we were not brides of Christ. We were widows of this world. Those that we wanted to yoke ourselves up with, which is the people and the sins of this world, are dead to the eyes of God. And, what's it, the orphan and the poor. What is it that we got from Christ? Everything. And what can we offer back in return? Absolutely nothing. Paul says it's our reasonable service. For what? What's reasonable service? Being a living sacrifice. To serve God daily. So we look at what the world does and what the world does to us. And we look for God's punishment. But if we're going to be in the same mindset, God gives us a new nature. He gives us a new mind. 
we need to be looking at our own minds, or excuse me, our own lives. And we should be hoping for God's punishment on us because punishment most of the time means correction to the life of a Christian. It means correction. If you've got something you can't step away from, should we look for God's punishment or God's correction in order to remind us? You know, most of the time there's a little... My mama used to... <laughs> She's talk about her, uh, I've got spankings from my Granny Harris. My Granny Harris, when she was in her 80s, could, she was like a, a conductor with a switch. You know, she was old school. She made you go and get a switch, and you better bring a good switch back, and then she would wear you out with it. Wear you out with it. And she called that a gentle reminder. She would wear you out and you're dancing like you're on hot uh, asphalt. And she's like, now, that's just a little reminder. Next time you won't do that, will you? And until you stop itching and burning, no, you were going to remember it every time you sat down. But sometimes we, we don't get the privilege of choosing what God's friendly reminder is. Uh, Brad Richardson, he, uh, I, don't, I don't know if Brad came up with it, but I remember he used to tell the young people all the time, we can always choose our sin. We can never choose our consequences. And most of the time, our consequences are not going to be what we thought they were going to be. I think everybody in here has made a decision that ah, it might not be the best decision, but the worst that could happen would be so and so and so and so. That's from our perspective. We don't know what God is willing to do or would allow to happen in order to get our attention. And because it's, we're not losing our life, and when I say our life, we're not losing an eternity with Christ. Anything God does, he can consider it a friendly reminder, a gentle reminder, excuse me. But we see here that while God was so willing to punish those around Israel, he was more upset at what Israel, what his chosen people had done to himself. And what had he done then? He had promised them a coming Messiah. He had called them out. He had taken Abram out, changed his name to Abraham, made a chosen people that we can't forget this. We're not going to be here for it, but Brother Richie's going through the book of Revelation, and he's been uh, expounding on that incredibly. And we forget that God is moving heaven and earth to reach his people at the end of this world. He is changing the natural laws of physics. He is changing the landscape. Mountains are going to be split open. See, I mean, all the different things God is going to do or allow to happen to reach his people. How much more does he expect us to be willing to obey him when he gave his son willingly to die for us, knowing that the only thing we can give back to him is our reasonable service, which is our life? And we've said so many times, God doesn't want you to live your life for Christ. He wants you to allow Christ to live his life through you. How much easier is it, you know, I mean, if everybody in here started a new job at some point in their life. When you go in and the boss says, well, you know, this is what we do here. Um, I don't really know what, you know, your job is going to be. Just, just go to work and, and figure it out. Go to work and figure it out. Now compare that if you go into a job and the boss says, this is what I expect of you. This is what your responsibilities are going to be. Here's your checklist. You don't even have to think. All I want you to do is just follow along with what this says right here and get that done at the end of the day. Well, you've got that checklist sitting right there in your hands. You don't, when I say you don't have to think, you understand what I'm saying. We allow Christ to live his life through us.
we go to him and we ask him the things. And, and here's the best part about it. When th something doesn't work out, don't think maybe that, oh, I did, I did the wrong thing. I made the wrong decision. I messed up. I shouldn't have done that. Those are all things that God uses. God is ever patient. He's ever loving. God, we, we follow the example of being patient and loving because that's how God is to us. So as we keep looking here, I want us to see in verse 9, as we finish up uh, chapter 2, God reminds them of who he is. He says, Yet I destroyed the Amorite before them, whose height was as the height of the cedars, and he was strong as the oaks. Yet I destroyed his fruit from above and his root from beneath. Also, I brought you up from the land of Egypt and led you 40 years through the wilderness to possess a land of the Amorite. And I raised up of your sons for prophets and of your young men for Nazarites. Is it not even thus, O children of Israel, saith the Lord? So God reminds them. He said, I, 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 I cleared things out for you. The Amorites were men that were, excuse me, tall as trees, high as the cedars, and strong as the oaks. These are men that you're not going to go in and beat hand to hand. But God says, I went in and I destroyed his fruit from above and his roots from beneath. If you've got a tree and you destroy all the fruit and don't let it go to seed and then you destroy the roots, what have you done? You've not only killed the tree, you've wiped it out. It's not going to produce anything else. It's not going to grow anymore. God did that for Israel. And then he says, and then I gave you the land. I brought you up from the land of Egypt and led you 40 years through the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. You know, I think we, you need to mark that in your Bibles if you mark it. You know, we talk about the Jews wandering in the wilderness. They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. God says right here, I led you in the wilderness. We need to remember that. When we look at our own lives and we look at some of those that we love and we think they're just wandering. Be patient. Let God have his, have his time. It might look like wandering to us, but God has a purpose in it. God has a purpose. I, I would honestly say if he hadn't have led them for 40 years in the wilderness, they might have went back to Egypt. They sure didn't want to for a while. But he continues there and he says, And I raised up of your sons for prophets and of your young men for Nazarites. And he says, if it was not even thus, children of Israel, saith the Lord. He, he says, this is what I've done. I've brought up your sons to be Nazarites, to be men set aside for the purpose of God. I've raised up your sons to be prophets. I, I, I've had them speak for me, thus saith the Lord. He said, haven't I done that? Haven't I done that? But then what does he say in verse 12? But ye gave the Nazarites wine to drink, and commanded the prophets, saying, Prophesy not. Behold, I am pressed under you as a cart is pressed that is full of sheaves. It's what he said, I've given you all these things for service of me. The Nazarites had certain rules. They couldn't cut their hair. Um, they couldn't have anything to do, you know, when we talk about uh, not drinking, okay, the Nazarites, if you study it out, they couldn't even have anything that was made of grape leaves or of the vines of grapes. They couldn't have anything to do with that. But yet they're saying, you gave, I, I call these men up to serve me, and what have you done? You've given the Nazarites wine to drink. Not only made them wear grape leaves around, you've given them wine, you've pull, polluted them spiritually, and you've polluted them physically. And those that I called up to prophesy for me, you've told them, prophesy not. Stop talking about God. We don't want to hear it. He And God says, because of that, I'm pressed under you as a cart is pressed that's full of sheaves. We've all been driving down the road and seen a pickup that was overloaded. 
or we've seen a car with a whole lot of stuff in the trunk before that you can tell it is pressed under a load. And we look at that, we always say, mm, man, hope the shocks don't go, hope the springs hold up, hope the tires don't pop. We say all these things. God is saying when his people do this to him, they're pressing him. What are they doing? They're taking the load of the sin of their lives. And not just sin, not just sin, but their desire to not want anything to do with God. And God says, you're putting that load on me, and it's pressing me down. It's pressing me down. He says in verse 14, Therefore the flight shall perish from the swift, and the strong shall not strengthen his force. Neither shall the mighty deliver himself. Neither shall he stand that handeth the bow, handleth the bow. And he that is swift of foot shall not deliver himself. Neither shall he that rideth the horse deliver himself. And he that is courageous among the mighty shall flee away naked in that day, saith the Lord. This is what God said. God's given each one of us a life to live. God's given each one of us strengths, and he's given each one of us weaknesses. And the strength that he has given us and the weaknesses that he has given us, he is completely aware of. Just like Moses, whenever God told him, go and speak for me, and Moses came up with all the different things and all the different reasons that he couldn't do it. Till finally God just basically said, Go. I've taken care of everything. Stop giving me excuses. The things that God has given us to, to use. He talks about here, he's given some accuracy with a bow. They might be great warriors. Some of them can ride a horse. Horses are fast. They can deliver themselves. All these things are ways people could deliver themselves. The swift of foot, those that are fast, they can outrun somebody. Those that are strong maybe can outfight somebody. Those that are good archers can take the enemy away from a distance. And again, those that can ride a horse can, um, you know, of course, can get away. And those that's courageous, someone like David, that was courageous to go and not only fight a bear and a lion, but also to go in front of the armies to fight Goliath. Courage. Is something that's given of God. But this is what God's saying. When you live a life that you're, you're constantly fighting against me, when the cares of your life are weighing the life that I've given you down to the point to where you no longer want to live that life for me, you no longer want to let Christ live his life for you, then maybe God will start taking away some of the things that he has given you in your own strength. And why is that? Because God wants us to understand that he is our deliverer. Whatever your gift is, if your gift is strength of mind, if your uh, gift is courage to get out and witness, if your, courage, if your uh, gift is uh, a mind that's good for, you know, um, discernment all these things god gives us these things to allow christ to live his life through us and if we are not willing to do it if we're willing to set it aside for our own gain first of all just as god punished those that did things to his people and we know look if we think about it i think this is something we need that pastor bobby says put on the sticky side of your brain how many of you believe this world is getting worse and worse and worse? Probably everyone in here. And if you can't see it, the Bible says it's going to. Well, just as I said, Habakkuk knew that they were going into captivity for seven years and knew that he wasn't going to see the end of it. We physically won't see the end of what's going on in this world. Why do you say that? Rapture's going to happen. We're not going to see it. We're not looking for the end of this sinless world. We're not looking for things to get better. We're looking for things to get best, for Christ to come and take us out of this world. And if that's our focus, just as I said, I think, 
whatever the last time I preached was, uh, maybe last Wednesday. If, if, if we're looking more at simply what God expects from us instead of looking around at the way things are, just as it talked about Lot, vexed his spirit. He vexed his spirit by keeping up with what was going on in Sodom. And I cannot say this enough. That doesn't mean that we are okay with sin. It doesn't mean we overlook sin. It doesn't mean that we don't call sin, sin. What it means is we're more focused on how God wants us to live in this world than we are about what the world is doing. And so I asked you the question tonight, what's the standard? What's the standard we're living by? Are we looking at the world and saying, well, praise God, I'm saved and I'm better than them. I'm in better shape than they are. I'm in better condition because I have an eternal home in heaven. Or are we looking at our own selves and saying, God help me because I'm so far from the standard that you want me to be. And I don't, we won't have an a invitation tonight. We'll just be dismissed. I thank you all for being here. I appreciate each and every one of you. I really do. Father, we do thank you for who you are. I ask that you just continue to be with us, Lord. I just pray that the message tonight would be what you would have it to be. Father, just help us to focus on our relationship with you. Um, if we do that, Lord, you can give us the, the new eyes that we need to be able to look around and, and let you handle the things that you need to handle. Um, and then whenever you do, as um, uh, Isaiah said, Lord, when you decide to send us, we can be ready. Father, we just thank you. I thank you for this opportunity. I do pray for our pastor. I pray you have him back um, at the next appointed time. Lord, I thank you so much for calling me to speak. Lord, I just pray that you would just continue to give me opportunity. And I pray that I would uh, just be an obedient servant as you would have me to be. I thank you for your people. I thank you for Faith Baptist Church and their willingness uh, to accept me, Lord, and, and the, um, the ministry that you've called me into. I thank you for who you are, for all that you've done. Christ's name I pray. Amen. Thank you all. Y'all are dismissed. Everybody except for Christine. I got a phone to pick for her.